very grateful for the band and praise team and leading in worship with us each week. Hey, we had a little glitch in the early service. Usually we try to do our Facebook live feed during the nine o'clock service and um, you know, get, move the table out of the way afterwards, but uh, we had a little problem with the sound. So those of you who are back on Facebook live with us, uh, we welcome you back. Trying again, 1045, we think we've got all the details worked out with what happened there. Uh, there was a college professor who, as he started off the new semester with his students, <clears throat> he began his lecture by bringing a large plastic clear container and setting it on the podium. This is one of those lecture hall classes where, you know, two or three hundred people in stadium seating, they're watching and this professor put the clear plastic jug up on top of his podium. And he reached under the podium and he pulled out a bucket. And in the bucket were big rocks. And he took the bucket and he started to empty it into the jar. And he poured the rocks in, kept pouring, pouring, until finally the rocks were bouncing off the top and rolling on, falling off and falling down, rolling across his podium. And he looked at his class and said, how many of you think it's full? And almost every hand in there went up. He said, okay. Put that bucket down, reached under his podium, pulled out another bucket that had smaller rocks. And he started emptying that into the top. He took the clear jug, shook it really hard. All the rocks settled down, kept filling it up till the little rocks started bouncing off the top, coming down on his podium. Put that bucket down and he said, now, how many of you think? It's full. A lot fewer hands went up, but still some hands went up. He said, okay. Reached down under his podium, pulled out a bucket of sand, and he dumped the sand in there, banged the jar, so the sand settled to the bottom. Sand was overflowing on the top of it, and then he took the sand bucket and put it down, and he said, now, how many of you think it's full? Nobody raised their hand this time. He said, you're catching on. He said, it's not full. He reaches down one last time, and he brings out a big container of water, and he takes the water, and he starts to pour the water, and the water drips down through the sand, through the rocks, all the way to the bottom to where the water is overflowing on the podium. He said, now, you may be wondering, what is the point of all this? He said, I'm going to ask your opinion. What do you think the point is? He said, no, this is where you talk to me, I talk to you, you talk to me. I want you to tell me. Call out. What do you think the point of this is? One fellow halfway up called out. He said, no matter how much you think you can get into your schedule, you can always fit something more in there. He said, well, that's a good point, but that's not the one I was thinking of. Somebody else called out and said, if you had started with the water, we'd already be done with this. He said, that's a good point too, but that's not the point. So the point is, if you don't start with the big rocks, they'll never make it in the jar. And as we start this semester, we've got to start with the big rocks first. And you know, there's some really sage advice there for all of us, especially in the church. We have to start with the big rocks. We have to start with the main things and make sure that they're the main things, not only in our personal lives, but in our church life as well. We're actually starting into a six-part series entitled Back to the Basics. What are the big rocks? What are the most important things that we ought to be doing here? What is it that we should be doing without fail when we get together, when we worship, when we minister here in our community? What are the basics? What are the most important things? What are the things that if we don't get them in at the very beginning, all of the other little things will crowd them out and there won't be room for the big rocks? What are the big rocks? What are the most important things that we ought to be doing here as a church? Now, you may be thinking, well, we already know that. We've already kind of gone through those things. Well, has it changed at all in the last few months? Would you say that the church's big rocks have changed in any way over the last six months? If they have, they probably shouldn't have been big rocks in the first place. 
If any of the big rocks have changed, it means that they weren't critically important in the first place. Because the big rocks should never change. The most important things should always be the most important things. The critical things, the foundational things for the church ought to be the same for this church, for that church, for the church here in America, for the church in China, for the church in North Korea. It ought to be the same all around the globe. The things that are the most important things ought to be the most important things regardless of where church is church. And so, we've got to make sure that we've got the big rocks in first. We've got to make sure that we're still focusing on what the big rocks are. So we're going to take six weeks, starting today, and we're going to talk about the basics. What are the most important things that this church, any church, every church, anywhere, ought to be doing? Now, today is a little different. This isn't really an overview. It's just kind of a foundation. It lays the foundation for everything else we've built on here. And today we're going to talk about the three greats. We're going to talk about the three greats. We're going to start off with the very first great, and we're actually going to kind of work backwards from these three greats. The first great that we've got to talk about is what many of you would know as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. This is found at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, End of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. He's already died on the cross. He's already been raised from the dead. He's revealed himself to hundreds of people. They are gathered on the mountaintop where Jesus had called them to. It says in verse 17 at the end of this chapter, actually the year starts at verse 18, but I'll read verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm going to talk to you today about the three greats. The first great is the Great Commission. Now, let me say up front, I know that these three, these three greats, could easily be three separate sermons. It would not be hard to spend 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, maybe even a couple of weeks talking about the Great Commission itself here found at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. But I don't want them to be three sermons. I want them to be together because I want you to see and understand these three greats that we're going to talk about today. The first is the Great Commission. This is the call that Jesus left with his followers before he ascended into heaven. These are his, some of his final statements. Now, here at the end of Matthew, we get this statement. At the beginning of Acts, we get a little different statement. Who's right? Well, they're both right because they were both things that I'm sure that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. And so Jesus is there and he's called his followers and they're there with him. And he says, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and make disciples and I want you to baptize people and I want you to teach people. Teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded. Now go. Now from this passage, there are three things that I want you to see. First of all, from this passage, the Great Commission, we need to understand that we have a providential call of God. Now, the part of the Great Commission that we usually don't quote is actually, I think, the most important part of the Great Commission. The Great Commission, we often refer to from verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore. That's where we begin. But it's verse 18 where the most important part begins. Jesus called them together and he said, Now I have all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I am absolute. I am the authority and I'm imparting my authority to you. We have a providential call of God. He has called us as the authority to be his representative. Now, if we were to talk about this in governmental terms, we probably use a little different term. Instead of a representative, we would, we would call him an ambassador. The United States sends 
political representatives, ambassadors to nations all around the world. Those ambassadors represent the United States' interests, their beliefs, and the decisions of our nation to other nations. So the ambassador to China represents the United States' interests in sharing with the Chinese leadership. The ambassador to Russia, the ambassador to Chile, the ambassador to Zimbabwe, they all represent the United States. They are representatives of the authority and the government that has sent them. They are not to make decisions that are their own. They are to represent the decisions that have already been made by their government. And if a decision hasn't been made yet, they're supposed to bring that back. And then when they have a decision that's been made, they're supposed to carry that. As people who've been commissioned by God, I am his representative. I am his ambassador. In fact, 2 Corinthians uses that term. We are now ambassadors for Christ. I have a providential call of God to share the love of God with those who've never heard of God. Secondly, the Great Commission not only is providential, it's personal. It's personal. We're called to make disciples. Make disciples. Look, disciples aren't made through a book. Disciples aren't made through a blog. Disciples aren't made by handing out a tract. Disciples aren't made by a TV program. Disciples are made by a personal interaction with another inter individual. Discipleship is always personal. Now, personal discipleship may draw in some of those other things, but a personal discipleship happens between one individual and another or a small group of individuals. Jesus didn't send out an email to call his 12 disciples. I know they didn't have email then, but you know what I mean. He didn't send out a scroll. Better? He personally went to them and said, Hey, drop that net. Come follow me. Hey, get up from that tax table. Come on, follow me. He gave a personal call. Now, not convinced of this? Let's just do a little survey, okay? Let's do a little survey. How many of you came to church the first time, first time, came to church because you were brought and or invited by a family member or a friend? How many of you? Invited or brought by a family member or a friend. Let's, let's do it the other way. How many of you didn't raise your hand just a second ago? I see one, is that two, three? Okay, out of a room of about 110 people, we have three. So about 97% of you came to church the first time because a friend or a family member invited you or brought you. Now, it might have been grandma that brought you by tugging your ear and dragging you in the door, but still, that was a personal invitation. That's just grandma's way of inviting you. Discipleship is personal. And when Jesus called for his disciples to go, he said, go, and the very first thing he said as an action statement, I've given you all authority, now go make disciples. The Great Commission is providential, it's personal. And the Great Commission is also particular. It was specific. He said, Go and teach them what I've taught you. Go and teach them all that I have taught you. You don't get to pick and choose what you teach them. 
If you're my representative, if you're going to fulfill the Great Commission, if you're going to share with those who need to know me, you can't pick and choose what you want to share. You've got to share everything that I taught you. And so those unpopular things, share them. Those politically incorrect things, share them. Those things that are difficult to understand, difficult to accept, you've got to share them. I want you to teach. I want you to baptize in my name, and I want you to teach them all the things that I've taught. The Great Commission is given to every believer. Now, you can't fulfill the Great Commission. You can't fulfill the Great Commission until you begin, till you start to fulfill the great commandments. Now we always jump to the great commission, go ye therefore into all the world. It's part of what the church is called to do. Yes, absolutely, the church is called to do that. But you can't fulfill the great commission unless we have started to fulfill the great commandments. Why are all these three tied together? Why are we talking about them together today? Because we've got to understand all the greats. The Great Commission, yes, we're called to share the gospel, but we've got to understand the Great Commandment in order to grasp the Great Commission fully. What's the Great Commandment? Well, it's actually in all three gospels, but this is from Mark. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, it says this. Now, Jesus has been arguing with the scribes and the Pharisees, and they're trying to trap him. And so they ask him all kinds of trick questions. He keeps answering them right. And then verse 28 says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving he had answered them well, one of the scribes came and asked him, What's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The great commandments. We're called to love. We're called to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. The great commandments. I know they're not part of the Ten Commandments. These are two that Jesus mentioned. And they are changed enough, altered enough, that they don't exactly match up with those Ten Commandments. But Jesus said, you want to know what the greatest commandment is? Okay, here. These two things will sum up everything else. If you can do these two things, then it will cover everything else that you see as a command from the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love, 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 love. Now that word love is such a limiting word, especially in the English language. Because we only have one word. And we throw it around so often for so many different things. Like, we use that word to say to our spouse, I love you. And then we use that same word to say, I love pepperoni pizza. We use that same word to say, I love that movie. Or, I love frogs. I don't know, somebody probably loves frogs somewhere and has used that term. Love, love, love. What does it look like? What does it look like to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What would that look like? Well, let's try this. <laughs> um, you ever seen a, a young couple in love? Have you ever been in love as a young couple? Some of you have to think back a long time. <laughs> ever seen a young couple in love? You can, 
there's some signs, right? Right? What, what, are some, what are some things that you would see from a young couple in love? Now, we're going to try this. And, and, and you tell me. You, you call out to me. Now, if you've got a mask on, you've got to shout really loud. Uh, what are some things that would identify a young couple in love? Ooh, what? Public displays of affection. Okay. Hmm. What'd you say? Okay. Holding hands in public. What else? They talk together. What else? <laughs> Always smiling. Yeah. You could you could tell when they're not married yet. I didn't mean that, honey, really. <laughs> what else? They spend time together. They always want to be together. The way they look at each other. Somebody said in the early service, I think Lori said, they're always talking to each other, always talking. You hang up. No, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. Uh, young couples don't do that today. Now it's like, you stop texting. You stop texting. No, you stop texting. <laughs> there, there are some signs. There's some obvious signs that they like each other. That's great. Now, how many of those things would carry over if we were talking about showing love to the Lord? Pastor, I can't hold God's hand. Can't you? Maybe not in a physical, literal sense, but you certainly can in a trust relationship. Lord, I don't understand this, but I'm going to trust you as we walk together through this time. Talk together? Sure. That's what prayer is all about. You talking. Spending time in the Word, that's Him talking. Walking around with a smile on your face? How many believers have you seen walking around looking like this? When's the last time you laid in bed and said, God, you go to sleep? No, you go to sleep. No, no, you go to sleep first. I mean, if you're in love... Aren't there some pretty common characteristics that exist with being in love? Whether you're loving the Lord or you're loving your neighbor as yourself or you're loving your spouse. Now, not all things, but certainly some things. Spending time with each other, talking with each other, listening to each other, enjoying each other's company. We are called to fulfill the great commandment. This is the call of the Lord. And the Lord says, I want you to grow in this relationship with me where you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I'm on your mind all the time. And oh, by the way, the second commandment is kind of like it. You've got to love your neighbor as yourself. You've got to spend time with your neighbor. You've got to hold hand with your neighbor and walk them through some difficult times. You've got to spend the opportunity. You've got to take the opportunity to speak with your neighbor. Share the word with your neighbor. Not give up on your neighbor. Now, we're called to fulfill the great commission and we're called to fulfill the great commandments. But you can't fulfill the great commission or the great commandment until we fulfill the great confession. Matthew chapter 16, in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, come back from the dead. 
and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If we're going to talk about the basics of the Christian faith, if we're going to talk about the basics of church together, if we're going to talk about the basics of walking in life together as believers, what's the first thing that has to happen? We all have to be believers. Well, Pastor, I believe in God. I believe that he exists. I believe that Jesus was real. I'm in church today. Or watching online instead of being out in the nice weather outside at the park somewhere out on the river. I believe in God. This is something a little more specific. This isn't just a confession saying, yeah, you're God. Yes, you're the Savior. It's a confession that says you're my Savior. I choose to follow you. I choose to submit my life to you personally, individually. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I've done things wrong. I've done things that I need forgiveness of. And I want you to forgive me. But not only do I want you to be my Savior, not only do I want you to come into my heart and save me from my sin and reserve a place for me in heaven, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my master. I want you to take control. I want you to be the one in charge of my life from this day forward. That's the great confession. Peter looked at Jesus and he said, you're the Christ. You're the chosen one. You're the Messiah. You are it. You are the son of the living God. We know exactly who you are. And we're here because we've chosen to follow you. We've chosen to surrender our lives to you. I want you to be my savior. You see, in order to fulfill the great commission, we've had to respond to the great commission ourselves in the gospel that was shared to us. In order to fulfill the great commandment, how can somebody love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, unless they've accepted the gift of salvation offered through Jesus Christ and asked him to be Lord of their lives? We can't. How can we love our neighbor as ourselves if we're not willing to love ourselves enough to accept the gift of life that Jesus has offered us through his death on the And it really is the simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son, his only begotten son, that whoever would believe, not just in their head, but in their heart, make a choice to surrender their life to Jesus Christ, believe on him, shall be saved. Romans chapter 10 says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, verse 13 says. There must come a time in every person's life, every individual's life, every single person's life, where you can say, I know, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. If you can't remember that day, you can't remember when that was, maybe you've been hanging around the fringes saying, I know there is a God. I know Jesus is God. I just don't know that he's my Savior and my Lord. Now, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor in just a moment. Uh, those of you who've been around here long enough, uh, you, you know that I, I've said this time before, but I, I just want to say it again. Okay. Um, when I ask you to do something like this, I'm never going to manipulate you. I'm not going to manipulate you in any way. I'm not one of those people who, if I ask you to close your eyes and bow your head, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up and then say, all right, now everybody open your eyes, and if you just held your hand up, you've got to walk down here to me. I'm not going to manipulate you because that's not what this is about. If I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, it's really just because I want you to isolate yourself from thinking about anything else around you. It's really just because I want you to have a moment where you can block out everything else 
except the sound of my voice and the spirit that speaks to your heart. So would you take a moment and just bow your head and close your eyes with me today? And I have a question for you. Are you sure? Are you sure? Beyond the shadow of a doubt, are you sure that if this is your last hour on earth, that in the following hour when you stand before your Lord in heaven, are you sure that he would invite you into heaven with him? Can you say with absolute certainty that you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, asked him to be your Savior and Lord? If you're not, if you're not sure, really is this simple. It's as simple as a prayer spoken in your heart. Lord, I've made some mistakes in my life. I need forgiveness of those sins. More than that, I need a Savior. I can't save myself from this. Only you can. Jesus, would you enter into my heart? Save me from my sin. And be my Savior today. Now, maybe you've prayed a prayer like that before, and you meant it. Maybe you prayed it right now meant it. For some of you, it isn't a question of whether you've been saved, because once we genuinely ask God to give that gift, he does, and he never takes it back. But it's become more of a question of who's in charge since that time. Are you Lord of your life, or is he? Are you in control or is he? Are you steering what's coming toward what's coming or is he? Maybe it's a question of degree. I love the Lord. I love my neighbor. But do we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do we love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves and provide for our own needs? Maybe we've just lost sight of this commission that he's given us to go. I have the authority, not on my own, but I have the authority of Christ. I am his representative. I am his ambassador. And I need to share his message, not mine. In this quiet moment, I just believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to many hearts in this room. In many different places in their spiritual walk. For some, you need to start in that journey with Christ today. For others, it's a matter of surrendering, letting him be Lord, loving him fully. And for others, it's a matter of sharing. We've surrendered. We love him. And now we need to share him and make disciples. Lord Jesus, in this moment, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to heart. that you would do your work. Not my work, not this church's work. Do your work. And that you do it right now. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, when we conclude our service, we usually conclude with a song. And when we do,